The gospel lesson for today comes from John chapter 14, verses 15 through 21. John sa- Jesus says this in, in that passage. These are his words. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. I will ask the Father, and he will send another companion who will be with you forever. This companion is the spirit of truth, whom the world can't receive because it neither sees him nor recognizes him. You know him because he lives with you and will be with you. I won't leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Soon the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you will live too. On that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them loves me. Whoever loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. May God add his blessing to the gospel reading. So in this scene, where Jesus is saying these things, and it seems like he's kind of saying them over and over and over again, this is where it happens. It's Monday, Thursday, right? Holy Thursday, Holy Week. This is during Jesus' passion. He has just washed his disciples' feet in chapter 13. Now we're in chapter 14. And his goal in this discourse in chapter 14, the beginning he talked about, in my father's house there are many rooms. I go to prepare a place. This second section is all about if you love me, you'll see me, you'll be, I'll be there, I will send the companion to you. He's talking to them about what it will be like when he is no longer in the body. As he is now when he's telling them this. He's trying to get them, pre, you know, he's preemptively trying to get them through the grief that's coming. Jesus said, I won't leave you as orphans. Suppose you know something about Hellenistic culture. I don't, so I had to look it up in the commentary. But Gail O'Day, the professor, uh, the late professor, uh, with the commentary in the fourth gospel, says that uh, in Hellenistic culture, you may know that the teacher's death leaves the disciples, and they call themselves orphans when they lose their teacher. And so when Jesus says this to them, he is saying directly to them, you know, I may not be here anymore, but you won't be orphans. It won't count the same way because I'm going to stay with you. And I'm going to send the companion, the Holy Spirit. Jesus is saying, I will never leave you. In fact, I'm going to do you one better. There's a companion who will be coming with you. And I know that we've always had difficulty in the Christian faith to understand the concept of God as three in one. I mean, we get the concept of a creator, right? All this had to come from somewhere. So we understand that to some degree. Science has shown us that there's, you know, this is world and there's this big universe and maybe there's many universes and we're finding out all these things. There's a creator, right? We, we believe there's a creator. That's kind of an easier concept to get. We have a lot of ideas about Jesus because he was one of us. We have stories about him, specific stories about his life, how he lived. He lived like we did. He fed people. He turned water into wine. He healed people. He talked to them. He loved them. He cried over them when they died. He was one of us. He died the same way we died. He seems to get us. He went through the stuff we, went through, we go through. And he's the central character into all of our cultural narratives, right? His birthday is Christmas. His resurrection is Easter. You know, it, it's, we build some of our culture around Jesus. But the Holy Spirit, 
You know, we have a little bit of a challenge understanding that third person. Do we really have a grasp on her? We have Pentecost, one Sunday a year, where we celebrate the miracle, the symbols of fire and wind. That's why, you know, if you ever see it, is it, I don't know if there's a cross and a flame around here. That's what the flame means. The flame represents the, the flame of the Holy Spirit. It's not a burning cross. <laughs> it's a cross and a flame. It's the Holy Spirit and Jesus. Uh, the, the creator is implied. <laughs> so, but, but do we really have a grasp on who the Holy Spirit is, what the Holy Spirit is? Luke talks more about the Spirit than any other gospel. And then Luke continues on with the work of the Holy Spirit through the book of Acts. So what's our contact with the Holy Spirit? I did a word study on the Holy Spirit. So in the NIV, in this passage, where Jesus says, I will send you a companion in a CEB, it's advocate in the NIV. In the message, it's friend. In the King James Version, it's comforter. In the Amplified Bible, <laughs> it's several words. Helper, intercessor, counselor, strengther, standby. One to stand by. But the CEB, the one I read for today, says companion. The root of the word companion is literally someone to break bread with. Companion with bread. Okay, great. So we've named the Holy Spirit. We kind of get a concept. It's, it's still nebulous. It's still a little woozy. Help us, these names help us clarify what the Spirit does, right? The names are what the Spirit does. How the Spirit acts in the world. Comforter, advocate, companion. And when we experience comfort and help and friendship and advocacy and companionship, we can see the work of the Holy Spirit. So maybe that's the way to understand how the Spirit works. So you've probably experienced this. You're just standing there in the street corner, or maybe you're at home sitting down, and all of a sudden, an invisible force invades your life with comfort, help, or friendship, or advocacy. <laughs> like a bolt of lightning. Maybe you're alone in prayer when an invisible force invades your life with comfort, help, friendship, or advocacy. No? Don't experience that? You do? Well, good for you. Um, not saying that it can't happen, but I think most of us have experienced friendship and help and advocacy and comfort in your life, but maybe it was attached to someone else, a person like you or me, bringing it to you. A person bringing comfort. You've been comforted, have you not? You've been counseled. You've been strengthened. You've been stood by. Remember that word, stand by? You've been stood by. Somebody stood by, beside you and helped you. No doubt that's your experience, but maybe it was attached to an actual physical human being. And when you think about how you were comforted, helped, befriended, counseled, you probably have this person in mind. Not necessarily a nebulous divine force that blows like the wind and burns like fire, but a plain old person that invaded your life with comfort and help and friendship and advocacy. In fact, for many of us, it was the first person we ever met who cared for us in this life. Mother. So we're looking for a metaphor to explain the Holy Spirit. We've talked about how the Holy Spirit works to be that helper, that comforter, that advocate, that companion. And of course, not every mother, if any at all, channels the Holy Spirit perfectly. <laughs> and mothers are not the only ones the Holy Spirit can work through, certainly. And it may be a couple or a handful of people in your life who taught you comfort and help and friendship. But the relationship of mother and child is one of many metaphors we can use to help us capture a concept 
of the work of the Holy Spirit. In the passage, Jesus is preparing them for his physical departure. He's trying to get their hearts ready. He says, don't let your hearts be troubled. He says, soon the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Jesus tells them, and not, not in so many words, I will never really leave you. I might not be here as I am now, but I will be with you always. I know people who have lost their mothers this year. And for them, today is a hard day. And for those who lost their mothers many years ago, it's still a sad day, but maybe with time it could be bittersweet when one considers the love your mother gave you and how lucky you were to have such a mother. This is also the first Mother's Day for a handful of women that I know who have lost a child in the past year. There is real pain in this. But remember this. Once a mother, always a mother. Even if, God forbid, you outlive your children, they will always be your children. And last but not least, women who are not biological mothers. Society has a way, you think we would have gotten it better by now, but that's still the way, of mistreating people, women especially, who are not parents. And Mother's Day focuses a glaring spotlight on this. But I would invite you all to celebrate Mother's Day. Because we all have a mother. Whether she was the essential essence and the epitome of grace and love, or one, like me perhaps, with feet of clay which did her best and gave what she had to give, sometimes selfishly. Whether she is related to you biologically or a spiritual mother to you, or both, if you're lucky. I hope you will consider celebrating the best parts of what you were given by a mother and mothers in your life. I hope you will consider the people in your life who have comforted, helped, befriended, and counseled you as the embodiment of the Holy Spirit at work in your life through another person. That companion that Jesus tells his disciples about in John's Gospel, I hope amid the joy and pain of loss and remembrance and love, you will be able to think of a true mother who has let the Holy Spirit shine through her and into your life. And I hope that you will say a small prayer of thanksgiving for her. And wish yourself, no matter who you are, a happy Mother's Day. Amen. Thank you.